Welcome to RP Gibberish, the podcast for RPG lovers by RPG lovers. It's that time of year again, ladies and gentlemen. E3, where all these wonderful games get announced and plenty of surprises all around. And with me, with this momentous occasion, of course, is the other master of RPG Gibberish, Aerodynamish. How you going, man? Hey, welcome back, guys. Very excited to talk about some E3, some of the games, some of the RPGs. So, yeah, excited. It's an interesting E3 because it, it could have been the best. I'll get into reasons why it wasn't, but it was one of the best E3s uh, due to one company in particular just coming out of nowhere and granting wishes, it seems. So, <laughs> which I will touch upon very um, soon. But um, what would, if I basically just to put you on the spot, what would you be your quick analysis of this E3 like compared to others? before it you know i going into it i was having the feeling that this was going to be a modest e3 just okay now i will say that during the event that you know i ended up watching a couple of press conferences there were some major shockers which i was not ex expecting but they are not very personal shockers for me they're games or ips that i've never played uh, or I'm not very interested in. So, but I do know how much excitement that is for some of the people out there, and I relish in that because it shows that with this E3, there's this sort of, you know, this sort of you know cult following, and the people are letting their voices be heard and they're being listened to right now. I have a feeling that companies and publishers they try to take more risks. And I see it happening over the last couple of years. We saw it at PSX with Codens, and now we see it here with some of the announcements. I, I have a feeling it's looking good to get some of your favorite series back out again, instead of just the cookie cutter sequels that we see for all these major franchises. And there was a surprising amount of Japanese and also RPG stuff at E3. So, you know, it was, it was solid. Um, I was missing that super wow factor for myself though. Uh, maybe maybe in a little bit, uh, but, you know, at least we all know what's coming for me, and it's Persona, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about one game in particular on Nintendo's end in great detail, because, um, uh, yeah, we'll talk about that more. Yeah. But uh, I do want to start the beginning off. Um, yes, and I use that word directly, because the first shots fired at E3 that really wowed everyone was... Um, Certain fan, fan base that uh, Nintendo has neglected for a very long time decided to throw an olive branch their direction with the official release of Marvel 1 on Virtual Console. And, um, wow. Just, yeah. that, that blew me away. <laughs> that, that, was, uh, that, that was quite a surprise, but uh, yeah, no, go for it. Well, of course, it, for anyone that's played Earthbound Zero, it's kind of less than a blow, but more mother fans essentially want more people to play the series and with this um that can happen and of course with a system that's sort of slightly starving for games like the wii u it's just a nice little entry where it's a game that the general public haven't had access to and with the wii u they can now play it so pretty cool yeah what's really funny is that was kind of one of the first uh, games we played for our quote-unquote weekly challenge back in the early days of RPG gibberish and i think i got like eight hours in and um something else drew me away but like i have a feeling if i downloaded that for the wii u i'd probably be able to beat it because mostly any virtual console game i seem to download on my wii u i beat so i think that's the way i'm gonna do it yeah no exactly i remember that uh that that was one of the uh that was one of the weekly challenges and you know, over the years, I remember having fun playing it, um, but I, when I when it was announced, I was very in, interested for for two reasons. Of course, people were now able to play it, um, and but the the other thing that I said immediately was, you know, this is going to be it's going to be interesting because a lot of people will get hyped up to play more than just Earthbound on the virtual console. But Mother 1 or Earthbound Beginnings, uh, or even Earthbound Zero, if you want to call it by the fan translator's name, it is not a fantastically well-polished game. It is a very archaic Famicom yeah. 
RPG and um, I have a feeling that Nintendo still left the very crude uh, encounter rate and low experience drop rates intact which when I played Earthbound Zero the ROM came built in with uh, experience multiplier so I believe it was two times or even four times multiplier which made going through the game a lot more faster and a lot more fun uh, without having to go through that very rough retro Famicom grind that is in a couple of games like I, I can't stand the original Final Fantasy because that is just ridiculous on the on the NES uh, I played it on the GBA and I played it on the PS1 and PSP that's the one I beat but you know the Famicom RPGs can be can be pretty tough so if you're out there listening to this and you love Earthbound just know that you will you're getting into the predecessor you're getting into a game that came out about six or maybe even seven years before Earthbound and it was still in that very early Famicom 80s RPG phase where some of these games were just they were great for that time but they have not really aged all that well uh, so you really got to keep that in mind however this announcement though is shocking in the fact that this will considerably bump up the fact that we will potentially see Mother 3 or Earthbound 2 if they're going to be calling it that in the yeah. future that was the biggest thing for me is the fact that they took a game they never released back in the day which it was it was the common knowledge that nintendo didn't want to touch anything they didn't localize back in the day with this you know the gates are open anything's free game and for a devout fire emblem fan like myself exactly. um they have they have the GBA Virtual Console. They've got the DS Virtual Console. Nothing stopping them from putting the Binding Blade on the GBA Virtual Console. Nothing stopping them putting New Mystery of the Emblem on the DS one. You know, I'm that's even going I'm... further. You know, why not get Genealogy of Holy War as well? Yeah, I, I, you know, it's so funny. People ask me, why didn't you include Genealogy of Holy War? It's like because of that one scene in the game, and you can't take it out. So. Uh. Even if it's implied, it's still a very tough thing to kind of deal with when it happens in the game. Although yeah, it, cre yet, so. it creates an awesome Game of Thrones type moment and it really puts it out there as one of the best stories, the darkest fucking story in Fire Emblem history, that's for sure. But um, yeah, see, with Nintendo with that, they wouldn't know what to do with that. So, And Fraysia is a diabolically hard strategy RPG, so... Um, that too would be taken into consideration. So those would be the two hardest Fire Emblem games to pretty much localize. But um, yeah, we'll see what happens. I, I don't see any need at all to do uh, the original, uh, the, the original on the Famicom because that's you know remade on the DS. I don't see a need yeah. to do uh, Mystery of the Emblem because there's new Mystery of the Emblem and Gaiden. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's not talk about Gaiden that much. <laughs> but uh, you know. Uh, it, it, it boosts the chances not only for Mother 3, which uh, it would be a fantastic win to see Mother 3 just released on the Wii U Virtual Console. It doesn't end for me there because I would still really like to see them just do a proper Mother collection or Earthbound collection and port all three on a 3DS on a cart and just just treat it well. You know, do a nice box set release, maybe a, a Mr. Saturn plushie in there um, and just take that risk or just once, you know, and just do something very passionate for the fans that they have been missing out on. You know, just these two Ness and Lucas Amiibos, they're fine. But just do something special. Uh, it's very interesting to see that we have to rely on, you know, the fans, like Fan Gamer to do like modern handbooks, etc. Um, which I recently picked up. But um, it, it would be, it, it's very interesting. This boosts the chances, not only for Mother Indeed, which I'm very hyped for. Um, but indeed, it, it also boosts the chances for Fire Emblem. I don't really know what else there could be, but especially Fire Emblem, that is definitely something I would like to see. I still have, you know, Sacred Stones on my 3DS Ambassador program and recently found out that that's actually not available on the 3DS. Uh, I think it is on the Wii U, though. But, uh, yeah. you know, there just needs to be... They need to port more of this. Uh, and isn't Radiant Dawn on Wii U Virtual Console right now? I haven't checked lately the Wii U, uh, the Wii Virtual Console on the Wii U, so I'll have to see that. 
That'd be silly though, <laughs> because yeah. it's so funny. Because so many people have not played Path of Radiance. I know a lot more people have played Radiant Dawn, but they didn't get their hands on Path of Radiance. Yeah, exactly. So, so that is that is definitely something that I would like to see as well, as to for them to, you know, there's been a lot of increase in the Fire Emblem fan base because of Awakening, um, and while I really relish in that and that there are new fans coming into. Uh, they need to make these older games available for them, and some of them are really ridiculously rare and difficult to find and expensive. So with Wii U Virtual Console, they're able to get a hands on them. But on the other hand, on the flip side, I do warn a lot of people um, that the Fire Emblem games before Awakening and maybe even before Shadow Dragon are ridiculously difficult and are mm. no cakewalk. There's no save points in between. There's no casual mode you will be no. frustrated. So that is definitely something I always throw out there, but they should at least offer the chance um, and just force them to buy it because I, I still know that there's not a lot of people that do piracy and stuff, but you know, you have the means to play all the Fire Emblem games in English now. So, um, except for the newest one, but we'll get to that. So, you know, just mm -hmm. having it on your systems on the Wii U and especially on the 3DS, they're, they're, you know, especially maybe not Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn, but just put it on there and that should be good. But I'm interested, you know, it's it's good what Nintendo is doing here. And it was a nice little announcement to see Earthbound Beginnings. And of course, um, around the same time, of course, not really sort of too much RPG related, but it is related to Fire Emblem is, uh, of course, Roy made it back to Smash Brothers, which... Uh, um, Luckily, I actually had enough to download him, and I was pretty much playing as him for like a good two days, and he is a great character. Um, it's cool that they announced the Roy Amiibo, and um, it's kind of a slap in my face because I just recently got all the Fire Emblem characters, mm. and now they're making me got one more to get eventually. So, <laughs> And of course, for you, of course, there's going to be the Lucas one that you can get for your mother collection, so... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the Amiibo craze is crazy. You know, there's been, they announced like 15 or them. I've already decided that I really just want the Earthbound ones and I want the Fire Emblem ones, excluding yeah. Robin. So, you know, I, I hope to get a Lucina at some point. I hope to get a, uh, a Roy and a Ness and a Lucas. We'll see. Um, but, uh, you know, it's fun that they announced them for, for fans and for uh, hardcore Amiibo collectors. Yeah, and of course, uh, you know, RPG related, it was nice to see the World Championship, and of course, it was nice to see all the people competing. But of course, um, beyond that, uh, very close in the tail of all that happening, Bethesda actually had their press conference, and a couple of things happened. Um, I will be honest, I will be deadly honest, there was one announcement of the Bethesda conference that made me roll my eyes in disgust. The fact that they want to compete with Blizzard for that half stone money, and yes, they're creating a card, a virtual online card game for the Elder Scrolls. <laughs> yeah, that that makes no sense at all. That is just uh, absolutely ridiculous that they throw that in there. Um, I'm not a really big fan of Bethesda anyway, uh, so yeah. yeah, not for me. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a little bit shameless, but I. Uh... I don't know. <laughs> but, however, they spent a good deal of time in the conference talking about Fallout 4. And when it comes to Elder Scrolls and, like, the later Fallout games, I don't hate them. I actually admire the dedication and the scope of those games from afar. But there's something that always happens in those games where I reach a point and then I want to play something else. And it's not because I hate the game. It's because, I, I don't know, there's just something about them. But... I do like the look of Fallout 4. I think it's a great looking world. It takes place in Boston. I think the visuals look amazing. I think what you can do in the game is amazing. You can customize all your weapons. You can customize like your power armor. Um, you can rebuild certain settlements. And the combat system looks a lot more polished. And all, all around, it looks fantastic. So... I'm going to consider it. I won't need to buy it because my dad's a huge fan of uh, Bethesda, so he'll definitely get Fallout eventually, so Fallout 4, so I'll just borrow it off him if I'm ever curious. Yeah, the, th the thing with that is, you know, I rolled into Fallout when Fallout 3 launched. I knew almost nothing about the game back then. Uh, I picked it up 
Um, I had fun with it for about 40 hours. I did a lot of exploration. Uh, there were some things about it that just made me made my made me cringe. You know, like the loot uh, that you can't loot everything, but the game is so centric on looting. Um, the side quests were nice, and the game was very rough around the edges. And then uh, I did a lot of side quests, and then I moved back into the main quest, and I was like, you know, this is it. You know, I was very disappointed in the end. Never picked up New Vegas, and I go into Fallout 4 just not very interested. This is one of those announcements where I know a lot of people are very happy that it's finally continuing after so many years. But, you know, we'll have to see, wait and see if... It's that typical Bethesda design that also turned me off on Skyrim uh, after playing it for like fa maybe 5 to 10 hours. So, you know... I, of course, I don't have it on my wish list right now, but if the game launches really well and a lot of people talk fondly about it and, um, you know, it, it, it interests me more once I see, you know, reviews and impressions from, you know, mo from you guys, then, you know, maybe I'll pick it up for the cheap. But other than that, you know, great announcement, but not really for me. Yeah, like I said, when it, when it, when I can get my hands on it, I'll just give it a whirl. But um, yeah, and of course that blew everyone by storm. I do like the fact that they've got a special edition uh, Pip Boy, where it's got a, uh, a basically a replica, and you put your smartphone in there, and you can download the app, and you can use it as an inventory. That is very cool. Practically, I wouldn't use it <laughs> because you'd be, you know, your mind would be on two screens at once. So I'm just happy to use the inventory screen in the game. But I guess for those diehard Fallout fans, they can do that <laughs> and immerse themselves more in the game. So, Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I'm still not used to this whole second screen thing except for the DS. But, you know, mm. I see it happening more that there's apps. You know, my nephew uses like Destiny and he can swap in and out his, his weapons on the spot from his phone. So, you know, it, it's working and people are adopting that. So great for that and that pit boy but it looks nice for 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 fans hmm so uh with that out of the way let's get to the main event sony yeah. who suddenly won the hearts and minds of a lot of people across the i was about to say the universe but i don't know if there's any gamers on mars and saturn in neptune and beyond so <laughs> you never know you never know never, never know but um, yes, they had a fantastic lineup full of uh, surprises and fantastic new IPs. Now, it's really strange because there's a game called Horizon Zero Dawn, and a lot of people are saying it's an action RPG. And I'm like, from what I've seen, it's more like an action adventure game, more in the same sort of vein as Uncharted and those type of games. And that's not a bad thing. It looks fantastic. And um, I, I like the fact that the world before them, the ancient ones, were pretty much our civilization. So it's a, it's take, it takes place in the future where I guess the apocalypse has happened or, or just at least the, you know, the crumble of a civilization happened and they're finding all these machines and I thought it's a pretty cool game. I'd probably give it a try when it comes out, but um, yeah. <sighs> yeah, it looked interesting, but again, I, I, I go into action adventure games really reserved because I've been burned out on this genre for a long time. It's never been for me. So uh, while it looks very interesting, and of course it's made by my, uh, you know, Dutch, pretty much only massive Dutch company that makes games, Gorilla. You know, we'll see more in the future. Uh, you can always pick it up, of course, but uh, I have to see a little bit more. Yeah, and of course we were jumping the gun because one of the biggest first surprises there. I mean, once again, not an RPG, but um, a very a entry from a much beloved studio, of course. Um, something that was considered vaporware came out of hiding and of course they showed off the last guardian and uh i actually now this wasn't a criticism of the game it was just me being honest and i don't have a problem with it the game doesn't look like it's changed that much since it was unveiled all those years ago and that's not a problem because um i thought the game looked fine originally but i'm yet to see sort of like the changes of the game uh, that basically the previous the ps4 presented you know when they had to, when they sort of switched to that platform uh, it still looks like a ps3 game to me but it, that's not necessarily a bad thing but um if you're a fan of ico this looks more to be a spiritual successor to ico than shadow of the colossus so um yeah pretty cool i liked what i saw yeah it looks nice um i i yeah i apologize for some of the fans out there i think that uh 
Ico and Shadow of the Colossus are extremely overrated. Um, so um, I'm not really into The Last Guardian. Uh, but, you know, pick it up if you're a fan. Uh, maybe I'll pick it up on a cheap. Uh, but, you know, it's it, at least it, it lives. So that's good to see. Alrighty, so we finally got our sort of non-RPG games out of the way. Let's get into it. And first up, a game that kind of made a lot of Final Fantasy fans just a little concerned of course they released this new game called world of final fantasy where they didn't release too much information but um you have these two kids and they basically came onto the screen in shibby form then they transformed into characters that looked like they belonged to a kingdom hearts game and then they joined various other characters of the final fantasy franchises and they have old school atb battles and that was pretty much all that was shown, <laughs> really. No major story elements, no nothing. It's just yet another sort of fan service Final Fantasy game for everyone. And I know there's a lot of people like, wow, this is so new. And it's like, no, this quest has given out tons of Final Fantasy fan service games. Like, you recently, there's Record Breaker, you had Dissidia, you know, and Kingdom Hearts was the grand date of all the fan service, you know, Final Fantasy games. So, nothing new. <laughs> So. Yeah, I, you know, I, I tuned out very fast when I saw that trailer. You guys know me. My love for Final Fantasy is completely gone. It, it just is. And I'm just treating it as just another series out there. Um, World of Final Fantasy did nothing for me. Like, fu- that's not even announced. Final Fantasy Explorers did nothing for me. And mobius final fantasy does nothing for me it's just these cookie cutters uh you know spin-offs and sequels that you know might have some redeeming qualities but they're all just there for one sole reason and that's just more money uh just you know it it, it looked it looked cute and maybe it's fun to play but yeah um whatever i don't understand why this needs to be on the ps4 it's of course ps vita as well so it's just going to be a quick port um, at first, I thought they were going to show Dissidia that, that's going to be in arcades, but that didn't happen. Yeah. So, you know, uh, check it out if you're interested, but I tuned out very fast for World of Final Fantasy. And I, I wish I could sort of switch off the Final Fantasy series, but Square decided to basically give, give me an offer I couldn't refuse with the next announcement, which has been long, long, long awaited, as you know. Final Fantasy VII is my favorite Final Fantasy game. And yes, it finally happened. No, no, no. That that so-called PS4 Steam version with upscaled original graphics was not the main version of the game they wanted to sell you. There is, in fact, a remake of Final Fantasy VII coming for the PS4. Once again, like the 15 trailer, how the narrator worded it, he was, they were speaking directly to the fans, having fun with them, mentioning stuff like the reunion. If you played Final Fantasy VII, you all know about the reunion. And of course, when they said the reunion will bring joy and it may bring fear, I'm like, wow, Square, you really know how people feel about your games. <laughs> so I, I, I like the teaser because that's exactly what it was. It was a teaser. It wasn't really so much of a trailer. It was really nice to see Cloud and Barrett like roaming around the slums of Sector 7. So I was like, yeah, cool. Um, for anyone that wants to know, this is not going to be just a nice sort of like uh, visual remake. Nomura is hellbent on recreating Final Fantasy 7, retelling the story. It's probably going to have a new battle system, which is the only part which has really got me concerned. But who knows, because I actually like 15's battle system. So um, if they make something entirely new, I'm all for it. Just don't put a stagger bar system in there. For love of God. <laughs> oh, man. So. Oh, oh. Don't get me started, man. I, I have a feeling they're going to making it an action RPG. Oh, man. I, I seriously doubt if I'm going to buy it, if they really turn it into an action RPG. I've read some people there, like, fine with that. Yeah, that's not going to work for me. I, I no. can't do that. I, I really want them to have the ATB system, but I don't want them to be, like, still, like... Of course, in the, the early Final Fantasy games, they lined up in a row, but they're just... They're, they're, like, stuck in that row. I want it to be more dynamic where they're moving about the battle, but they've still sort of got the ATB system. That's what I kind of wanted. But, mm-hmm. um... I would like to see that as well. That would be nice. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. that that It needs to be a little bit more dynamic. 
uh, you know, I'm just going to, uh, you know, Final Fantasy thirteen. We'll, we'll see what happens with the battle system, but I like the fact that they're going to overhaul the story. Maybe there'll be more scenes in Midgar. would be cool. I hate the fact that the one thing the fans were concerned of all was the fucking cross-dressing scene to the Honey Bean Inn, and I'm like, are you really fixated on that part of the game? That's just one minor part for me. Mind you, most of the parts that I only remember is just all the bouts with Sephiroth. And mostly all the heads of Shinra. So <laughs> I guess this part, I don't know, take it as you will, whatever parts of the game you liked. Although I really did like the Gold Saucer segment as well. So, um, and I did like Cosmo. I just love that game in general. I mean, I'm, there's no one moment that I really love and stand out. But the fact that that's the concerning part, that's kind of sad. <laughs> yeah, that makes no sense at all. Why, why you should really get hung up on that. I, I just really look forward to seeing all these classic moments uh you know in uh in in true great hd fashion being all voice acted probably update the dialogue because we all know how badly translated P uh, the ps1 version was so i think that the, the the story will bring a lot more dynamic to it and i really hope that they will indeed throw in some more story scenes some more interaction maybe a couple of new characters you know it doesn't need to be a one-for-one -one remake uh, they look at Persona for Golden, you know, they added in a whole story arc with this new character throughout the entire game, and that worked and it fit, so they can do that. Yeah, the, the, one of the biggest concerns, and it was half a concern and a lot of people wanted to do it, was Nibelheim's going to be very interesting now in the remake because of Crisis Core. And I'm wondering how much they're going to use of Crisis Core um, with this remake, and I'm predicting either in the end of 2016 or 17, I sincerely believe that they're going to re-release Crisis Core, Crisis Core for the PS4. I just have this feeling. They did it with Birth by Sleep for the 2.5 collection. I have no doubt they'll probably do it for Crisis Core. So, mm. we'll see what happens. I didn't think about that, actually. It would be interesting to see. Um, the, the one thing I do, I do want to bring up about Final Fantasy VII, though, is... You know, I talked about this in my own video as well. It's, it's a little bit, a little too late. And now I see a lot of news announcements coming in. Yeah, now we were working on this before we were announcing the PS4 release. Uh, I don't believe that at all. Because if anybody with a little bit of shred of sense would have thought about what they were doing at PSX, they would know how, how fans would be outcried at building that hype during that event and then just doing the port. So... Again, I feel that Square Enix is being reactive here, and now they're just trying to make amends for that, that, that pain they caused me personally. And that's why I'm not very hyped for it. And also, I'm very realistic. This game is not going to come out to this year, next year, 2017, 18, maybe 19, because we have Final Fantasy 15 still not dated, Kingdom Hearts 3 is still not dated, and Nomura is doing this after those. So... You know, yeah, he's got a bit of a reputation and infamy, really. I, I actually like Nomura as a game developer. As a head of a project, I think he works better as a games designer than someone that works with other people. I, do, do you have that feeling that he hasn't really got that great management skills because his games always get knocked back more severely than most other RPG projects? So... I, yeah, no, I, get I have that a feeling. feeling that he is, uh, you know, he he just keeps building on scope and scope and uh, scope creep, as we call it in the, in the profession, you know, software development. He just keeps piling on new features and stuff. And perhaps he's also very, um, how do you call it, you know, perfectionistic and spends a lot of time on tweaking elements where he should maybe focus on other aspects which aren't done yet. I don't know, uh, but he indeed drives better as a designer than as somebody who is directing and has that managerial duties as well you saw that um you know kitase which that is a true shame kitase yoshinori kitase he had that under control he did such a great job during the ps1 era together with sakaguchi uh but you know mm. then kitase stepped up and did a lot more higher up square enix stuff instead of focusing on the actual game so uh, that is one major loss. Uh, Sakaguchi is one major loss, of course, that really changed up the flow and release cycle of these games as well. Yes. Um, 
like I said, I, I, I will reiterate saying I love Nomura as a storyteller, except for one part of Burst by Sleep that made no fucking sense, which is the character of Vanitas. I'm like, ah, I mean, seriously, what you doing there, Minoru Nomura? <laughs> yeah, well, Kingdom Hearts in general has become super complex and... Yeah. After all these many years and not having played any Kingdom Hearts game in the last, what is it? Well, it's more than three years now. Dream Drop Distance is the last Kingdom Hearts game I played. Yeah. Just that story is so complex. And I have, I hope they are able to bridge the gap well for, for three. But uh, yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, um, most of the people, of course, for Final Fantasy VII, they're excited. It's their dream come true. A lot of people, 30 to 40, were the most emotional. Rightfully so, because that was the target audience back in the day. I played FF7 when I was like, it was a 2000, and I think it was 12. So, and that was a game I played to death for two years straight. So, um, I'm looking forward to seeing this new vision for Final Fantasy VII, so I shall be down for it. However... That wasn't the only game that uh, that kind of really made people emotional. And this, for me, was the biggest surprise of E3. Once again, not really an RPG, but it can be considered it. But it doesn't have any traditional RPG elements. But there's a lot of exploration RPG elements in this series. And I never thought I'd see a sequel to this in my lifetime. And, of course, thanks to uh, the good sir, Tier, he helped me play the first game last year. No and problem at all. Happy to help out there. And I beat it, and it was the best experience on the Dreamcast. Of course, I'm talking about Shenmue, and I've met a lot of people in the YouTube sphere that they don't just like Shenmue, they love it. It's like something they're attached to. And when Shenmue 3 got announced, it was really funny, because I love the soundtrack to Shenmue, I know all the tracks. So when they did the Kickstarter segment and the Shenmue theme played, I was paralyzed. I was like, are you joking? And I was like, do not fuck with my emotions right now. <laughs> and sure enough, um, Yu Suzuki came on and said that they're going to do a Shenmue free Kickstarter. And all these, all the dreams came true. And sure enough, the thing was, base, the base Kickstarter goal was done in nine hours, which was $2 million. <laughs> just nine like, hours. Wow. Just shattered every record. Uh, just amazing. It's a little, I just looked it up. It's now only at three and a half million. So in the last like five days, they only got one point five million. But, yeah, you know. I, I, that's that's the nature of Kickstarter. Usually it peters out. Some people only doing like fifty thousand to a hundred million. And in you know Shenmue's case, it's kind of like they peter out to about half a million a day. That's nothing bad. <laughs> so I I um I'm really happy for everyone. They've wanted Shenmue free for so many years. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens now. There was some controversy, but I don't think it's that much of a deal. I kind of expected it. The Kickstarter funding is not going to fund the production of the game. Basically, it was they've, they've said in an interview, Sony wanted to do this to gauge the interest to see if it was worth it, and Sony's going to be putting up most of the bill of the production, which is going to be amazing. Now, a lot of people are concerned because... Back in the day, like these games cost seventy million dollars to make. They were like at the time, they were unheard of. That that amount of money was unheard of to make a video game. And of course, Sega actually never made a profit off those games, which was sad, of course. But they were so critically acclaimed, they were always stuck in the back of people's minds for the rest of their lives. So, and a lot of people who are now like the heads of the industry, gaming industry, and a lot of new sites and a lot of developers. A lot of them played Shenmue, and it means a lot to them. So um, this was kind of a wish come true for a lot of people. And um, I basically said it best on uh, my uh, Facebook wall. Like, yes, the base goal is done, but you want to, like, expand the game. You know, just tell them what you want. Like, put it out there, like, what you want. And uh, I, I would love to... I can't wait to when I get to the stage where I can play free, because I'm actually struggling to play two right now. No, the game's not hard. My disc is fucked. So, <laughs> so I got to get that fixed before I can uh, get like 100% excited for free, but I'm really, really excited for Shenmue free. And I'm more happy about people because this might seem weird. I spent like six hours one day just watching people's reactions. It was like 200 Christmases and birthdays come at once for them. <laughs> And some of the reactions were downright funny. Like, did you see the game trailers reactions? Like, no. professional reporters. 
lost their shit. Like they they jumped up and down the table like monkeys. It was hilarious. <laughs> And there's this one uh, female reporter that didn't understand what Shenmue was, and she was there in the middle, like, "What the fuck's going on?" And these three other guys, it, yeah, it was like it was like the number one game they've always wanted from their childhood. So like they forgot that they were reporters at game trailers for one minute, and they were just like, and it was actually cool because it kind of humanized them in a way. <laughs> it yeah. kind of showed that hey, they are gamers foremost and i think that even the guy behind the camera was losing it he screamed out all our dreams are coming true so yeah, so if anything sony just kind of brought back that positivity in the gaming community that's kind of um been kind of hidden of late so a good job for them and it was like a home run with the free games for most people so um yeah fantastic you know i think oh, one of the God. funniest comments so, sorry to cut you off, but one of the funniest comments I said, wow, Sega wasn't at E3 and they did the best thing they did in ages by doing nothing. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, it, this is, this is of course, a fantastic announcement. This is what I was talking about in my intro. Is that this is showcasing your voice and show that love for a series and get that game that you really want. Now... You know me, I've never played Shenmue. I've, I, yeah. I look into this one with a lot of reservations because I am concerned that I won't like it because it's like an open world game and you can, in my opinion, I apologize for using these terms, but you waste a lot of time just doing nothing. Uh, I know that I do love a great story in video games and I know Shenmue have, at least that's what I've heard, have great stories in them. So, you know, I have to look into them but the thing now is i can't really play them uh, maybe emulation on my pc but i would like to see that sega also does a remaster of the first two um, yes or at least a, a quick dirty port that we're able to just boot up the games on our ps4 maybe uh, that would be interesting uh, because that way you know a lot more people can actually get more invested in these except for just the people who played these games over the many years but uh, and yeah. A couple of years ago, it was rumored that they were in production because uh, Sega was doing their line of uh, Dreamcast HD games. And um, they were supposed to be the next one, and then they got quickly got buried. And now I'm wondering, did they get buried because of all the secrecy? Who knows? And they probably jumped ship to the PS4. We'll yeah. see what happens. About that secrecy, it's a great announcement, don't get me wrong, but... Who in the hell permitted Yu Suzuki himself to tweet out a forklift picture one day before <laughs> E3? Like, who greenlit that? That makes no sense. <laughs> well, see, there's been so. The thing was, is Shemu fans take any sort of rumors with a grain of salt because they've been burnt so many times. Like, every time E3 comes around, they hear rumors, but they don't get hyped up because they usually get disappointed. So, Yu Suzuki tweeting the forklift. It's cool, but they know they don't want to get their hopes up because they they know that it won't be you probably won't be anything. But the fact that this was the year that it was something, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I did the same thing with uh with Final Fantasy Seven. Uh, Silicon Nero was the only one in the world saying that it was going to be announced, and I was like, yeah, right. And I actually called them out on Twitter. I said, if this news is fake, I will never go to your website again. But it turned out to be correct. So they have some very evil sources there. But I was going into that one with a lot of reservations. I was like, yeah, right. That's never going to happen. But both of them did. And that was actually very surprising. Uh, so that's awesome. Yeah, yeah it, it's wonderful. I'm so happy for all my friends out there that get to experience the continuation of this awesome series. But anyway, we shall continue on. No, I'm not going to talk about that uh, dating sim from Katsuhiro Harada for the Project Morpheus. Did you see that video? <laughs> <laughs> uh no actually i didn't i never really looked into a lot of the virtual reality things i don't really feel that that's for me but it's so weird that it's an official product by namco by katsuhiro rada and you are basically in the summer home with this very good looking blonde lady and of course i saw the video and i started off my gut because all the guys know what we were thinking the same thing <laughs> <laughs> and um Nah, it'd be pretty boring. But basically, she, I think she just goes around. She says, I'm going to do this. Do you want me to do this? And basically, the controls for the game is you shake your head or you nod your head. And yeah, I think it's going to be a very harmless game. 
weird as shit was that Katsuhiro Harada appeared in the game. Last thing you want to see in virtual reality is the guy of Tekken <laughs> just appearing out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know it, what he wants. He's probably going to challenge you to a game of Tekken or something. I don't know. Interesting. I, I got to look it up. But, uh, you know, um, Mr. Harada, you could also be working on something called the Xenosaga Trilogy HD. Just yes. saying, man. Just saying. Just, uh, just, you know, don't hype us with tweets and then don't deliver. <laughs> Yeah, Although I've especially... never played them, I, maybe they suck, but I've never played them and I would like to give them a try because of all the fans loving these games. It'll be a long time. Like, if Harada's in control, he's got four projects at once right now. That's crazy shit. That's Nomura levels right there. So, <laughs> so maybe, yeah, exactly. when a couple of them, maybe when a couple of them come out. But, uh... Alrighty, we're going to be uh, talking about the very safe, but... Not as bad as everyone else makes it out to be. Nintendo Digital Event. <sighs> People, I don't know what you want because this event didn't bother me the slightest. Was it the best they ever did? No. Was it the worst they ever did? Try watching that E3 conference where they talked about Wii Music. Then you'll know the depths but that, that they I, I have to be honest, that was just a moment. And that was the first thing I thought. It was just Vitality Sensor and Music. Those were just moments, but they still had good games. I'm going to be honest, that digital event, just a digital event, I'm not talking about the later Treehouse, in my opinion, was one of the worst Nintendo E3 conferences that I've seen. They were very low quality, like just cons consistently not so good. But that's my opinion, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was safe. They didn't do any sort of big blockbusters. Cause I'm not a big Star Fox guy. I don't hate it, but I don't have. I've never had a time for the Star Fox. So if you're a Star Fox fan, pretty cool. Um, I'm not. I love Murtrae, but I'm not going to be signing that fucking petition petition to discredit Federation forces. I mean, seriously, you don't want it, don't buy it. Exactly. That's yeah. Exactly. No, just don't buy it. But this, while I do understand it from one point and it's like again letting your voices be heard and just tell nintendo no we don't stand for these types of you know cookie cutter spin-offs we don't deal with that shit we want proper games for our series while i do respect that this is taking it a little bit too far in my opinion yeah yeah of course so of course that i, I watched the like the demo didn't really interest me it's not sort of my type of game however what did interest me and of course uh Everyone knows how much of a fan of Zelda I am, and of course they announced uh, Triforce Hunters for the 3DS, which is kind of a spiritual successor to the Four Swords Adventures using the same uh, program and engine that they did to run Link Between Worlds. Looks pretty cool. I won't probably expect anything story-wise. It's more of a gameplay, cooperative play Zelda game, and I love the puzzle solving in Zelda games, so I'm actually all for it. So, Looking forward to Triforce Hunters. Yeah, that's again that I I, I just played the, the the big Zelda titles, you know, but uh, it's uh, interesting, especially if you are ma massive Zelda fan and you would like to play together with other massive Zelda fans. Uh, it, it it looks nice. Now, how about that Hyrule Warriors for the 3DS? Are you going to be buying it again and spend about two hundred hours again on it? Because I'm interested to find that out. My 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 uh, my drug my addiction. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good thing is, is you can connect your save to your Wii U, which is like, thank God. Oh, because... wow, that's awesome. I didn't know about that. Yeah. That's, that's no, really I cool. Know. Well, I, I don't know if you can actually put your save file into the 3DS version, but what you can do is you can take the character, new characters from the 3DS version and transfer them, refer them to the Wii U version. It's like, thank God. Thank goodness for that. And supposedly there's going to be more battles uh, that's based on the Wind Waker, and they're going to put probably... Hopefully they'll transfer them too, so... Because I've done so much fucking grinding in that game for badges. And it's nearly... I'm nearly reaching the 300-hour mark. And I, I, I don't want to start that again. <laughs> I do not want to... As much as I've enjoyed it, it's my favorite game of last year. One of my favorite gaming experiences. I don't want to start it again on the 3DS. So if I just buy the 3DS because I'm a massive Zelda collector, put that on my shelf, display it. And uh, use it to transfer all the DLC to there. I'm I'm fine. I'm happy. So okay. And of course, if you've never played it before and you don't have a Wii, you have a 3DS. It's awesome. However, I do have to be honest, saying as as a big Warriors fan as I am, handhelds are not optimized to play the Warriors games. It just saying it's one of those games. It feels more comfortable on a controller. So just be warned about that. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I have a feeling this is going to be somewhat uh, like Xenoblade Chronicles-ish. You know, it's just, it's nice to have it on the go, but it's not optimized for it, and it's not going to be as good as the, you know, console version, I would say. As opposed to, say, maybe a Persona for Golden, which improves upon the original PS2 and is much more fun to play on a handheld. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. I feel like I've already said I've played more... I played, put more hours into my version of the Golden than I did my PS2 save file, so that that's totally, totally, totally right. So, anyway, we've come to the point that I've been waiting to talk to Arrow about <laughs> yeah. with the E3 episode, and of course, I did my other podcast, the Saturday Morning Trust the Mac, and that was the most anticipated moment of that recording as well. So, and I'm going to have two different opinions that I'm looking forward to hearing. Um, first up, let's talk about. Fire Emblem If, otherwise now known as Fire Emblem Fates, which I actually like the name. Um, they showed off quite a lot. They showed a trailer with the English localization. Love the voice acting. Very awesome. I really like the trailer. But more than that, as Arrow Legend took before, is the Nintendo Treehouse was very extensive this year. They would be doing... Uh, they actually basically they did like 30 to 40 minute demos of the games, and I think Fire Emblem Fates actually got two different days worth of uh, the video demonstrations, which is pretty awesome. Got to see the game in motion, and I think the story is amazing. Like, uh, the first battle is really cool by Fire Emblem standards, and something that I've been hoping for has come true. I've been wanting a worthy Fire Emblem villain for a while now, and King Garon is a filthy piece of shit. He really is. <laughs> that that first battle where basically he wants to see if his uh, son, your main character, basically has the ability to kill another and basically forces him to fight these uh, prisoners from the Hoshido clan. And I, I thought it was a really cool first battle for the game. And, of course, when you beat them, he orders you to execute them. And, of course, apparently the main character has a conscience where he doesn't, and shit gets really nasty from there. So, thank you, Nintendo and Intelligent Systems. Finally. Finally, I have a villain that I want to kick the shit out of. That's all I ask. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I looked a little bit at the treehouse because, you know, uh, I have time. Uh, it's limited, but I just saw a couple of battles and uh, attacks, and it looks very solid fire emblems. So I'm very, very cool there. One thing that uh, really blows me away about fire emblem fates is that it really feels like they, they it's fire emblem mixed with Shin Megami Tensei in the sense that it has the alignment system, it has the law, the chaos, and maybe even as well as it's mentioned, there's a third scenario, which is going to be a neutral route as well. So I really like that style uh, that you're able to choose between alignments. That that seems to be lifted from Shin Megami Tensei, just saying. Uh, I have a new prediction now what that new scenario is going to be, because there was a piece of news that was introduced this week from Japan, and it's the final piece of news before the game's release next week. The marriage system is back in, in Fates, and you do have offspring. I have a feeling the third scenario may be Generation 2. Like well, Genealogy of the Holy War. I thought that when they announced the game that it was going to be you choose between Hoshino or Hoshido, you choose between Nor, and then the third yeah. scenario is you picking no alignment. That's what yeah, I that, that that's what I thought too, and I'm keeping that out there because this is just a prediction. This is not fact, but with this marriage system in there, it brings out that thought because uh, I was talking with uh, Taylor. Both our greatest fears is uh, <laughs> the reason he didn't like awaiting was the whole time travel element where the the offspring, the children, come back in time to help their parents. That's actually my greatest fear for if. Like, I don't want that to happen a second time. <laughs> so um, I don't want any sort of time traveling elements in if because I just wanted that to stick to awakening. And I'm hoping that the second generation only comes into like the later chapters in the game where some time has passed and the children are old enough to fight alongside their parents, that I will buy and that I will gladly accept. If it's another time travel plot device, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> I didn't so. find it that much in Awakening, but I can understand your reservations. 
But uh, I'm already sold on this game. I was this close to spending a lot of money on getting the Japanese special edition, yeah, as well as the bundle with the cover plates. Uh, but something inside me said, you know, let's just wait and see what happens because in the end, if this comes out in the West, then you know I'll have to buy it again because I can't read Japanese. So, uh, but yeah. that that artwork looks gorgeous. I want to have that on my shelf, and I really look yes. forward to Fire Emblem Fates. It's one of my most anticipated games for 2016, for sure. Yes, I'm the same. I thought the, the artwork on that special is just so beautiful. I, as much as I'm building this Fire Emblem Shrine, I don't have the money to go buy both versions of the game in Japanese. So I'm going to wait. There's rumors that they actually are going to do the both versions, like that rumor that it might come as the one. It's still up in the air. But someone suggested that, that Nintendo said they might be doing the, the dual versions, two different versions like they do with Pokemon. That doesn't bother me, so to speak, because I'll buy both versions. For anyone that wants to buy the one version, you can actually download the other version uh, as a part of the game with the eShop. So you've got you've got yourself covered there. So pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I really do like the English voice acting. I do like what I saw of the story, um, sort of the localization. So yeah, really looking forward to next year for Fire Emblem Fates. Now... Um, Arrow, I wonder if we've got another five hours to talk about this game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I, <laughs> uh, much is to be said here and much in a positive way because for me, this was the best announcement at E3. Uh, I'm going to be honest, during just seeing the trailer again, it was after seeing it at Japanese director, while it was a little bit different, it was nice. But again, Nintendo three, Treehouse blew me away because they finally showed this game in action for 45 minutes. And that really put me at ease at calm and showed me that this is the game that I want. And this is most likely going to be my favorite Wii U title. I am very excited for this particular game. Yes, as uh, Eero alluded to, they showed a lot more of a... Uh... It's so funny. They actually called it by its Japanese name, which I'm not even going to attempt. You know, Gamba Ibu Roki or something like that. I know I fucked that up. I, I Sharp just, I just call it Sharp FE. Yeah. Sharp That's... FE. But it's so funny that they called the Trias video by its Japanese name phonetically in English. But they actually said that the name is not final. So I actually have a, I have a guess what they're going to call it. I wouldn't be surprised if they call the game like the Mirage of Fire Emblem. Because... I like what they're doing. Basically, if you would slash everything from this game and call it Persona 6, I'd believe it. <laughs> I really would, because um, I, I, I was blown away. The one thing that I watched this video, I was blown away at the level of detail this game had. This is the type of game I look forward to owning a console for. And this was the type of game the Wii U was starving for. Not because it was just an RPG, just because of the level of quality to show that it was sort of like, it, it, you know, it really pushed the console to its boundaries. I mean, we saw that scene where the main character, Itsuki, went into the, you know, the, the streets of Shibuya. He went into a Hiho store, which is, of course, the Jack Frost store. I was blown away how detailed everything was in that convenience store. You can go up to the counter, you can do this. I mean, most Persona games, you'd just go into the store and it'd just be like a quick, quick menu with like a flashy sort of, like, uh, still sort of shot of the store. But here you are, you can walk around the store. And I was just, I was blown away at the detail of this game. And everyone's wondering, well, everyone was complaining for the longest time, you know, Shin Megami Tensei X Fire Emblem, why is it, why is it taking so long? Why is it taking so long? After watching this trailer, I understand why. They were hard at work building this game. You know, visually, um, I haven't listened to most of the soundtrack, but it was cool, but the battle system, fantastic. Like, if you're a fan of Persona, you are going to be so happy when you play this battle system. It is so cool. But, um... One thing I have to say that I kind of called early on that was really cool was you go around Shibuya and uh, all the basically all the NPCs in the background are all these like multicolored silhouettes. And one part of the trailer that I was blown away, and I think Aero attested to this as well, is when the the idolosphere, the other world, came into you know the portal of Shibuya. They were sucking out the creativity or the happiness of the characters around them, and all these multicolored characters started to turn to shades of grey. And I thought, that's Atlas for you. <laughs> yeah. I thought, artistically, that was amazing. You know, 
it really did give this great atmosphere of, for this world they're creating. Uh, the other thing that blew me away, they showed the first dungeon, harken back to Persona 3 and 4 again, just how the character Itsuki had his uh, sword out. It reminded me of, uh, you know, Yu Narukami having his uh, sword out in Persona 4 and, of course, the main character, Persona 3. And you have to go over to the Mirages, which are... Actually, I'm going to give the floor to Ero for this because I've kind of taken away too much and I give Ero will explain the whole Mirage system with uh, Sharp Ethic. So, yeah, um, the system is... It's, you know, again, a lot of people just watch the trailer and are turned off by its very colorful aspects. Um, but if you look at the 45-minute the treehouse, they really go in-depth. They show you everything. They show exploration, dungeon exploration, battle system. And basically, how I perceive it is that you have, um, you have the main characters who have these, um, you know, who live their lives in Japan. And for some unexplained reason, this other dimension, the idolosphere, you know, comes into play and it summons these um, legendary beings, which are classic Fire Emblem heroes and bad guys into the world. And at first they are, uh, you know, they're called mirages and they are pretty much bad guys. So they're kind of like shadows in persona. Yes. And that's how they roam around. And then the, what happens is the main characters, they go out and they, I don't know how, but they un awaken their power all the main characters by the way they are performers the one is uh, uh, an actor wants to become an actor one yep. as you can see in the trailer she is a singer uh, and then you know i'm pretty sure they'll add in some more styles there uh, with some maybe un unannounced characters but they unlock the, the ability to do a performa which sounds very similar to persona and what i've understood is they have the ability to take these mirages and besides just the normal enemies, they at some point change the mirages into these performers to help them further along. And you can recruit them over time. That's what I've gathered from the treehouse. So um, that's pretty much how you go through this game. And that's what establishes the bad guys versus the good guys. Now, I'm pretty sure that there's going to be some evil entity or evil corporation, you know, trying to bank on this. I'm pretty sure it's typical Atlas. They will, they will fix something in there. But I kind of like that dynamic to see that, you know, the classic Fire Emblem heroes are kind of these, you know, uh, you know, they are these mirages. They are first the bad guys and then they can recruit you. Uh, you know, you can recruit them later on. I think that's a very interesting mechanic. We saw some boss fights at Treehouse. We saw Mad King Gangrel from uh, Fire Emblem Awakening, which was a huge epic battle. He looked, his design looked very nice. And, um... Yeah, you just go around and have fun in this third-person dungeon exploration. Uh, all dungeons based upon real-life Tokyo areas. So one of the dungeons they showed was inside the Shibuya 109 building, which is a fashion store. So they kind of build it upon fashion. Very interesting to see. And of course, you know, what really calmed me uh, after you know seeing the original trailer didn't really make sense, but... It's to see that it's a traditional turn-based press turn system, including the Fire Emblem weapon triangle weakness system. Uh, and that really calmed me down and, and see that it's just a traditional turn-based battle system that, you know, that's helping me. I don't know how you feel about that. I actually was blown away with the battle system because they this was the one part of the game that merged Fire Emblem with... I wouldn't say, it's, well, Shin Megami Tense in general, more so Persona, because when we look at the Persona stats, we're so used to looking at their weaknesses and their resistance and what they're strong against. The fact that they took that base idea and took the elements from Shin Megami Tensei and basically inserted the weapons triangle as the four other alignments, it was the, like, you know, systems of that. And I thought that was so cool. Like, you know, if you are a sword user and you go to a stab an axe enemy, which they showed, it'll come up the weak status like they do in the Persona games, which is pretty cool. Just Shin Megami Tensei in general. So I thought that was amazing, you know, and to incorporate both those systems is just such a simple idea that makes it so much, so effective. And that was the biggest surprise for me because it just, it was the nice blend of the two. 
and I really dig the battle system. I like the fact it takes on a stage. There's a crowd around you, and like there's the uh, there's laser lights everywhere. It's very glamorized. Um, but I did like the fact that there's a lot of strategy, like the Persona games. You have to consider what enemy to hit with what character. Of course, they use the um, the performer ability. They would act like Personas, like the of course the Fire Emblem heroes. Like the main character Itsuki has Chrom, and Chrom looks badass. He looks a, a, like a Dark Lord version of Chrom, basically, in my opinion. <laughs> looks really cool. Uh, Sita, uh, uh, Shida from um, the Arcania Saga draft, uh, Shadow Dragon, she was the performer for the, uh, the basically, the singer character. Tsubasa. And then they had Tsubasa. Oh, man. Top tier waifu right there. <laughs> and then they, they, have this, had... they have this awesome meme picture, which is her... Uh, which is her outfit, and she has like sunglasses on, and says like "Deal with it." I love that meme. Uh, that's so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and um, there was the final one, of course, was Kane, which was from Shadow Dragon for the uh, redhead character. I think it was Tobu, Tomu, or something. Tobu. Um, yeah. Cool. Like, there's gonna be more characters coming. Like, uh, there was an Archer character um, based on a Fire Emblem hero. I don't know which one yet. There'll be more to come. My prediction is, is if there's going to be a spellcaster character, my prediction it will be Soren from the Radiant Saga, will be the performer for that character, because Soren's as as far as fans go, that he's probably the most, uh, uh, I would just say famous of all the magic users. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's Soren. I'm trying to think of like other characters that could probably do, but um, uh, I'll I'll just leave it that. Maybe maybe Hector can be like an axe user. Who knows. <laughs> But yeah. I, I'm actually, but as Zero just said, then uh, they confirmed that the Fire Emblem villains will be the boss battles in the game, and that also made me excited. Like you had King Gangrel, which was pretty cool. I'm looking forward to villains like Garneth and Nagol, and uh, you know, I like one of the big ones is uh, I won't mention it because it's kind of a spoiler for Sacred Stones. I'm glad Zero mentioned that to me. I won't mention that. Um, I, I really hope it's not Medeus, because that would be the most simple route to go, that Medeus is the one behind everything, because he was the very first main villain, but if you actually played Shadow Dragon, didn't really play so much a part, he was like the character everyone uh, alluded to, like talking about, oh, the Dragon King Medeus, but when you fought him, it was very few words exchanged, but he wasn't really an in-depth Fire Emblem villain. Um, I would rather see like someone like Nagol have a bit more of a power. Now, there was... Um, I kind of talked with my Fire Emblem buddies, and we did have our theories that one of the sort of evil-looking characters that was shown in the trailer, we think that it could be the villain, one of the main villains of the Binding Blade in sort of like this other form. So I could be wrong. Who knows? But that'd be cool because kind of her face kind of really resembled that particular character in the Binding Blade. So... Mm. It'll be interesting. It'd be interesting if that comes to pass. But uh, I would say number one, I was blown away with the battle system, and I was blown away with just the level of present, present uh, presentation. This wasn't just a cheap cash in title. They really worked on it, and I give kudos to Atlas. And you know, aside from the Fire Emblem elements, aside from the Shin Megami Tensei elements, I'm seeing this as a triple A type RPG for a system that's starved for RPGs. So, bring it on, seriously. <laughs> oh yeah, no, most definitely. And you know, I, I want to bring up two points, which is the original teaser. So the original teaser dropped a couple of years ago, uh, 2013, I believe, at the Nintendo Direct. Now, just before you think about if you're disappointed by Sharp FE, which I know some of you are, just look back at the trailer. All the, well, the teaser. All the teaser basically was, it was Shin Megami Tensei. They just threw out a couple of character portraits. They showed Fire Emblem. They threw out a couple of character portraits. And it ended development in progress. That's the teaser right there. Now, of course, me included, we all went rampantly crazy. We were thinking, what is this game going to be? Is it going to be strategy RPG? Is it going to be demons in the Fire Emblem world? Is it going to be Fire Emblem characters in the you know, Shin Megami Tensei post-apocalyptic world? Oh my god, this is going to be like the best, darkest crossover ever. It's not. It's a unique title that looks extremely interesting for me personally. 
I know some people still take issue with the fact that it's like performers, idle simulator. I've heard these arguments as well. I don't care. It looks a like a fantastically great game on its own. Yes, I do agree it has more elements of, say, Persona in there than maybe Shin Megami Tensei, but it's still Atlas. The director of Radiant Historia and Strange Journey is working on this, which are two top-tier Atlas games right there, so I feel right at home, and I'm sure that while it looks very cutesy and colorful on the outside, the story will take some great strange turns. They hinted at this with Treehouse, that Tsubasa... Her uh, sister is lost. She feels that she believes that she's maybe kidnapped or taken by the Mirages or something like that. I am pretty sure that there's going to be a very dark and epic story in there. I don't feel concerned about that at all. The only thing that I would really like to see, though, is just a little bit more of that uh, demon design or persona design that we're used to. We saw the Jack Frost. But you know, I would like to see a little bit more in that as well. If they're going with the original enemy designs that they're using right now, they look exciting as well. I could use a little bit more of that. But that being said, though, I am very excited for this. This is my game of the year or game of the E3 show. It calms me down. I'm very happy to see it. I'm very happy as well that Europe is getting it as well. I just hope they time it well together with the American release because I cannot import the American Wii U title. But I'm hype. I will be there. I hope it comes out, uh, you know, around, at, at, not at December 2016, but I'm very into no. Sharp FE for sure. It, it'll, it'll be latest mid-2016, honestly, because, you know, they're working hard. We saw some English screenshots there. So, uh, was was it in, I can't remember if it was in, English. I think the battle system had the prompts, but, um, no, really cool. I'm really, really digging it. I, I was really surprised. The only, I think the only part where I shook my head is they showed that part with the idols attack with the love hearts. It's the only time I shook my head, like, oh, really? <laughs> but yeah. you have to expect that. But like like Eero said, they will, it will go for a dark term. It's, it's the guy who created Strange Journey, I have no doubt. You know, I still need to play Radiant Historia. I don't know why I don't have a copy yet. But anyway, looking forward to Sharp FE and... I, I would, you know, in, in the comments, in the Facebook, uh, I want to get the creative juices flowing. What would you want this game to be called? Because of the whole Mirage things, because the word illusory can also mean Mirage as well, illusions, Mirages. So it could be like the Mirage of Fire Emblem or something like that. So, yeah, I, I, I well, let's see what they come up with. Uh, I'm very interested to see what they're going to be called. I think they will use something like Mirage in the title. I think that makes mm-hmm. sense. But, you know, meh. We'll, we'll see what happens. I, I'm up for suggestions. And until then, I'm just going to call it Sharp FE. And uh, here's two games that were actually shown at the Treehouse. And these are games that I never thought would come out. One I'm actually excited for. One, not so much. I know a lot of people are because this was one of the best-selling games in Japan, or at least the sequel was. Um, they showcased a few Level 5 games. Uh, one of them was a game that I've been kind of really looking forward to for a long time, and that's LBX, the Little Battles Experience. Um, as I'm a big fan of games like Dark Cloud, and I love Rogue Galaxy, so I'm a big fan of Level 5's action RPGs. And this was the only game that has been sort of like or closest to an action RPG by Level 5 in a very long time. And um, as a fan of Gundam and sort of I've done model kits, I'm really looking forward to the LBX because it plays like an RPG where you basically have these little miniature plastic models which sort of come to life and you sort of like, you know, control them and you battle other mechs and you gain parts and the parts level up and everything. Apparently it has a real serious story, even though it's got that Saturday morning cartoon vibe about it. So uh, I'm really, really excited they're finally localizing this. Um, of course, the, the PSP is sadly expired for a lot of uh, developers and a lot of distrib- uh, distributors, so the 3DS version seems to be the safe bet, and I'm glad that they're going to be taking it. It's going to be coming out in August for America, and Europe's going to get it in November, but looking forward to it. Oh, yeah, it's not really for me, but uh, I'm happy that it's coming, of course. The other game, of course, by Level 5 is one of their best-selling games in a long time, and that's Yokai Watch, and... I'm actually kind of reserved about this game because there's a lot of things I like about it. Like, it ha- does have that Nino Kuni S sort of in, wouldn't say like Battlestar, but that environment, like 
when you go around the, the real world town in Nino Kuni, it has that same sort of vibe with the city of Yokai Watch. And you, it is kind of like a slight Pokemon clone where you go out and you go find these Yokai, which are like these ghosts. You train them. The battle system's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> because apparently in the battle you basically flip the watch and you basically like you know when you set a watch and you like you turn the dials and all that you can actually turn the dials and it turns your party with new members i said to myself that's actually kind of odd <laughs> but yeah uh, that that's uh i was very excited when it was announced i was like oh it looks like nino kuni i know it's very popular in japan then i looked at some gameplay trailers and i was like yeah right okay i'm not gonna pick this game up the gameplay system is not a traditional turn-based system that I would like to see, so I decided to not, you know, to not go for this game. Yeah, the exploration and sort of like the finding of the Okai, that interests me. There wasn't really much story-wise, and the battle system, I need a lot more convincing. I'll put it at that, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm more excited for LBX more than anything. But it's nice to see Level 5 finally pumping out their ways because it's taken them a long time. Um, but yeah, hopefully they do well. But uh, that's it for uh, Nintendo. And uh, who who wants to who wants to fire the gun first? Well, you know, there's also Bravely Second shown uh, at the yep. Nintendo Treehouse, which is nice. Uh, I didn't really watch the entire Treehouse. I know I want to buy that game, uh, so I look forward to seeing that in 2016. But uh, that brings us indeed to a very good point, which is. Uh, Bravely Second is developed by this little studio you might be uh, aware of, and that's called Square Enix. And about an hour after Nintendo orders right away, Square Enix did their press conference. And while it was fantastic for some, uh, some other people, your hosts included, thought it was just shit. Yes. The, a lot of people think I'm crazy saying this was actually my least favorite conference of E3. And it's not my biased opinion towards one series, which I will get into. I actually thought half the conference was boring. And I blame myself by getting suckered into the hype because, you know, before the conference, they had a lot of uh, trivia moments where they mentioned series they worked on. And I'll say this now they were stupid to do that because they got a lot of people's hopes up and that 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 so-called video where they bleeped out all the things that just got everyone into hype mode no matter if you you know if you are a fan of chrono cross you're a fan of secret of mana if you're a fan of certain series you're a fan of certain series which is called dragon quest you were certainly hyped and i've got my only myself to blame for it but seriously getting to that they had a lot of Western developer games. They had um, so Just Cause 3, Rise of the Tomb Raider, Hitman, and Deus Ex. Out of all those Western games, only Rise of the Tomb Raider actually interests me. I actually have played a bit of the first uh, Tomb Raider reboot, and I actually am enjoying it. That high-octane, sort of Uncharted-esque sort of action-adventure type of title. Really enjoyed it. Um, looking forward to probably Rise of the Tomb Raider, like well after its release like when it comes down in price but the other game for me like... that was deus ex by the way deus ex is uh, a game that i really enjoyed on uh, on the ps3 uh, and that is definitely a game that i am going to pick up for sure uh, when it comes out uh, on the ps4 but the games like hitman just cause for hours I was, I was nearly falling asleep because it was like late at night for me it's like no late early in the morning it's like nearly three to four in the morning and I stood up because of the hope to hear news of different games. And the first one that they surprised everyone with, and it was kind of a slap in the face to me and Aero, a new Nier game that's going to be made by Platinum Games. And I, I think, uh, good sir, we might be the only two people in the community that's not really that excited. <laughs> I, I was, uh, funny enough, I was watching a stream with uh, Devil May Pie, who is a, a huge fan of Nier recently. So he was uh, blown away by it. It was very interesting to hear his opinions when I was sitting there. I was like, great for the fans, but so I'm a fan of certain Square Enix properties. Or am I going to get my treats here? But, you know. Yeah. It's it's interesting that they that they do this. Uh, again, and it harkens back, cult following, taking risks. 
uh, because, you know, these games are pretty obscure, but I'm very happy that it's coming out for all of you great action RPG fans, Platinum even, that they, they do a lot of awesome stuff So on the, on the action front. So look forward to this title and definitely pick it up. But uh, yeah, you know, not really for me. Uh, maybe one day I'll be near. Maybe one day. <laughs> I don't. I don't know when. But um, there was another action RPG there that I actually really did enjoy seeing more news of. And of course, Kingdom Hearts Three made a showing. I have to admit, the part of the trailer where you had uh, young Master Xehanort and of course my young Master Ericus. That's what I needed to basically tie me over until the next piece of Kingdom Hearts news. Man, I couldn't I, pinpoint who they were. Thanks for reminding that they were, you yeah. know, that, no, I, I, I didn't know who these characters were, but now I know. Thanks. No, no, no worries. And they had that chess game where they were talking about the Dark World. I was like, this is what I love about Kingdom Hearts. Not so much the Disney characters. And yes, the Fire Emblem, I'm sorry, not Fire Emblem, Final Fantasy fan service. Is good and all, but it's that original part of the story that makes me love the series. And it was cool to have that great moment between the two where they were playing chess. And that sold me. And of course, then they showed trailer of, uh, sorry, the footage, of course, of the future with Sora, Donald, and Goofy fighting the Heartless in the Tangled World. I actually, I think the game looks beautiful. I think it looks fantastic. This was the next generation Kingdom Hearts game that everyone has wanted for a very long time. And it looks fluid. It looks fantastic. And the fact Nomura tweeted that this is not going to be the official build, which is like, look, I know, as Eero said, I know you like piling on new ideas. This looks fine to me. Don't fuck with it. <laughs> you know? Oh, it looks absolutely fantastic. I love that the cameras pull back a little bit. I keep mentioning that, but that is just a very small tweak that I really dig because it makes the action much more easier to spot. And it just looks absolutely gorgeous. And... Um, you know, Tangled World, I'm in there. I really like that movie. Uh, I'm pretty sure we'll see some more uh, great classic new worlds in there as well. And, you know, um, I'm extremely excited for this game. Um, it is, the wait is, 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 is very, it has been very long, uh, which that is not good at all. Uh, you know, well, the, the wait has been a, a pretty, pretty long time. So, Maybe it's been a little bit too little too late, but I'll still pick it up. I'm still very excited for it, but I'm I'm wary because I know full well that I haven't played Kingdom Hearts in three years, and it's not been as awesome a journey as say Kingdom Hearts one and two, which have been over ten years ago when I just started getting into action RPGs. So uh, I, I got I got to be cautious. I got to be cautious, but of course you guys know me. I'm gonna pick it up. Yeah, that, that's a definite. This this was the highlight of the Square Enix uh, press conference. So, as much as I say it's my least favorite, at least I can walk away saying that I got a taste of Kingdom Hearts Three, and I thank them for that. And then, of course, they showed the trailer again, which is kind of redundant because they're kind of it's kind of like saying, "Oh, you weren't at the Sony conference." Well, here it is, and I'm pretty sure everyone was watching the Sony conference. Just to remind you, yes, they are doing a remake of Final Fantasy VII. The other, di other follow-up that I knew was going to happen is uh, the crew at Triace came up and talked about Star Ocean 5. And I, as I said on Trust of the Mac, I consider Star Ocean to be the ultimate 8 out of 10 series. <laughs> Where it's a great game, but it never reaches the heights of Masterclass you know, RPG-dom. So I like playing Star Ocean games, but I'm not like of the hardcore variety when it comes to you know Trias and star ocean so when it happens i pick them up i play them i do like the little changes like uh there's no transitions anymore the enemies you see out on the field you can go up to straight away it actually kind of resembles uh, uh infinite undiscovery in that way but i think it's a lot more cleaner than infinite undiscovery was but um i like the fact that it's got a six-party system uh reminds me of sui code in that regard so um I think with the six-party system that's going to lead into some really hectic battles when there might be like 20 enemies on screen at once and you've got the six characters that have to spread out to the field. Um, really cool. Story-wise, they, they pushed it that it takes place before, free. So who knows what's going to happen, but I like the fact it's on an uh, unidentified planet, underdeveloped planet. Um, it starts off with like the medieval feel and no doubt towards the later part of the game, 
you know, is going to be like the space opera element of the game. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about it. And when it happens, I'll give it a go, basically. Yeah, that's nice. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm very hit and miss on Star Ocean. Um, I've only played one and three. Uh, didn't, or I played a little bit of four, didn't particularly care for it. So uh, I still have to play Star Ocean 2. We'll see how, how that, you know, goes. Uh, but until then, you know, I'm happy that, again, this is coming out for fans and it should be a very interesting game for you guys to uh, to enjoy. And this is something I want to discuss because you're going to laugh at this. The creators of the Star Ocean series came out today and admitted, and they, they this was on the record, that something was not right about Star Ocean 4. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I remember, re I, I read this. It's very interesting to see today. They actually admit that, you know, something was wrong with this game and they, they're trying to fix it. So, you know, that's uh, that's that's very interesting to see. It would be interesting to see how they change it uh, for the better. Maybe they can sort of create a sort of a new sort of Star Ocean experience and, I don't know, get a whole new following. But uh, that's where our sort of like, okay, good news ends. Because, yes, um, the Square Enix president came out. And he, you know, he was very excited to sell everyone that Portal app. <laughs> that I don't really care for it. <laughs> but what he said, um, before I go into that, he was talking about the first project of uh, Tokyo RPG Factory, I think it was called. And uh, it's called Project Cessna, and they only showed some art pieces, some concept art, nothing to really get too excited over. But it was his final speech that... When he said it, something kind of snapped in my mind. Where he basically said that, yes, we have these Western developed games, but our foundations have always been built from RPGs, and RPGs will always be the main focus of this company. Well, that's well good and all, but Dragon Quest fucking 7 didn't make an appearance. So, <laughs> what do you say about that? Oh, yeah, well, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. I, I don't understand what's going on in their head anymore because there were actually, there are right now five titles from Dragon Quest. Well, maybe there are six Dragon Quest titles that I know of. There is Dragon Quest Heroes, which is announced and that is coming, but that's a spin-off. There's Dragon Quest Seven, and that has been unannounced and it's not coming. There is Dragon Quest Eight for the 3DS, which is announced recently, not announced at E3. There is uh, Dragon Quest X, which understandably, but again, that is also out on many systems, not announced. There are the Dragon Quest Monsters 3DS remakes, which are Terry's Wonderland, I believe, not announced. Yep. I understand that. And then personally, I know how much you hate them, but personally, I thought it was going to be a very easy game to localize and just release, and that's still on my list. And that's Dragon Quest Theater Rhythm, which, you know, easy game for the 3DS right there, but apparently it's not going to come out. So I guess I have to go and import a Japanese copy from my Japanese 3DS. But just, just think about it. These are six games. Only one of these six is coming out. That makes no sense at all. Not even the main number title, 7 and 8. And this is Square Enix. This is Enix. This is yeah. Dragon Quest, the original RPG series. Yeah. And I'm not even such a big fan as you are. I am pissed off about this. I don't understand what the fuck Square Enix is thinking here. Just I, 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 I allowed myself to get too hyped up and I walked away from that conference heartbroken. I really was. I was like, I'm done. I'm going to bed. Didn't even talk to anyone the next day. I was like, I thought this would be the year. The year. Well, let me tell you this now, Aero. That, that no one took it lightly. Everywhere I go, every Dragon Quest forum, every Dragon Quest Facebook page, like Square Enix opened up an official Dragon Quest Facebook page. Originally, it was Dragon Quest Heroes, and then it became Dragon Quest. Every post, where's Dragon Quest Seven? Where's Dragon Quest Seven? Where's Dragon Quest Seven? <laughs> Just plastered, and they're going to see this for the next few years until they do something about it <laughs> oh man yeah it's just i uh, i i i don't understand no. what, the, what their deal is i i just i just don't i, I just don't get it like yeah. 
don't come up on stage and talk about how awesome your RPGs are and it's your foundation when you are just completely ignoring your number one series. I'm actually I'm actually surprised that they didn't even show Dra Dragon Quest XI or did a teaser yeah. on it. I know that's probably more Tokyo Game Show. Hype, yeah, th but... that'd be sacrilege to announce that outside the homeland, which is like their True. baby. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. But this is absolutely ridiculous, you know. They, uh, it, I, 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 and also, I, I, I don't really don't understand what, what they're actually doing with Dragon Quest in Japan. You know, why pour Dragon Quest A to the 3DS? Like, I know, but why not, why not just the Vita as well? The Vita, it, it is capable of handling so much more. Uh, and, and I understand mm. it was the only Dragon Quest game that is now, uh, well, not on there. Everything is on there, right? One, two, and three, maybe not, but it yeah. should have been ported on there as well. But with DS and 3DS, I mean. But yeah, it's just you know, oh, I just the the worst thing though, and whoever made that trailer should be fired, is they had Frog's theme from Chrono Trigger as the theme of that trailer. So of course, all the passionate Chrono fans came out of the closet saying. Oh my god, there's going to be another Chrono game. We both joked saying it was going to be like a HD version of Chrono Trigger for consoles or something like that. But um, the fact they did that and they didn't even do anything Chrono related, that was just a kick in the teeth for Chrono fans. Yeah, I, yeah. I didn't even... I, I just read the post that they were bleeping out six things, but I didn't even see that it was going to be like the... Uh, I didn't even hear that it was, you know, that, that there was a, a frog team in there, so just uh, it's i don't i just don't get it what they're doing yes they announced some awesome stuff yes near is coming yes final fantasy 7 is coming they have a very strong foothold on the western development market bravely second is coming uh but you know dragon quest heroes as well but just in general they're yeah. just you know let's not even get into that other fan base that i am very vocal about because I, I got I hyped like, there. Because I was thinking this is going to be the year where they're going to be doing the World Ends with you too. It makes sense for them. I, do, I just don't get it, Square. Look at the popularity that Persona is having right now. I played the World Ends with you before I played any Persona game. And retroactively, when I played Devil Survivor, I was like, man, this is ripping off the World Ends with you. But now I realize the World Ends with you was kind of a sort of rip off of at least persona and it it i just don't get it because it's so easy you do a sequel to it mm. and you have kind of like a rivalry competitor to persona which is stealing a lot of your sales away i i'm honest i am not buying final fantasy shit anymore because i'm spending all my monies on the shit making me tense and persona it is so easy for square to just put it into production and just say here guys just go work on it just do even a sloppy sequel, just a same visual style, sort of a retelling story, recurring characters. You don't even have to think about this really hard to do a sequel on the 3DS and it will sell a lot of units. I don't get it, guys. What the fuck are we doing here? And the sad thing is that's one of Nomura's, so he really, he would have to hand it over to someone else if it was to get done. There's no way he wants to add something else on top of being the lead of the Final Fantasy VII remake. So yeah, it's a pretty he, he crap. Can, he can he can definitely he can just very quickly on like an afternoon just design some characters. One of the characters is already designed, which was teased in the iOS remake. He can just say, guys, just just do it justice. You know, I I, I trust you guys. I'll do some, you know, I'll, I'll come by once every while. What is it? Maybe an afternoon. I'll look at the assets. Just. Just make another sequel. Just throw in some pins in there, some new powers, and you know maybe do something fun with maybe the the 3ds and maybe the gyroscope shit, and just tell another Reapers game story, and just have some kids in there and they have to survive and just you know do it well and have Neku show up as like a sage, and just just do it. You know, just release it, mm -hmm. just put it out in stores quickly and then localize it so that we can steal some of that Persona crowd back. <laughs> I'm passionate about this shit, man. I know, I know, and that, that was actually that was a series I was hoping for you because I'm I haven't 
I'm not saying anything bad because I haven't played it, so I can't say anything about The World Ends With You, but I was kind of hoping that for you, just sort of like to bring you back into the fold, but no, nah, we both got screwed. <laughs> and the yeah. thing that pisses me off more than anything is their jail, get out jail free card for me as Final Fantasy VII. I cannot get fully pissed at them because there is a game that I will buy for them. But it, it, for, for you, you're stronger. <laughs> you can resist it. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. no, it's, you know, sure, I'll buy Final Fantasy VII. I'll buy Bravely Second. I'm excited for those. Uh, but, you know, that's 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 actually it. That's all the Square and, and, and Deus Ex. I'm not going to lie. Deus Ex, I'm very excited for. But those are actually, and Final Fantasy XV and Kingdom Hearts 3. So, you know, they are very active. Um, And I recently recorded a video talking about Atlas. And I mentioned this again. Where Atlas, I feel, really takes thought and time and thinks about the games that they're releasing, their spin-offs, their remakes. They make sense. And they put extra content in there. But I don't have that feeling with Square. It's all about quick and dirty money making. Just look at World of Final Fantasy just slap it together quickly, make a subpar game for the PS4, and make a good game for the PS Vita, and just sell it, you know, sell it and market it well, and say it's Final Fantasy and lure in the people, sexy limited edition, uh, and you know what, and just they're they're lying. They are not in this anymore, purely for the Japanese RPGs. That's what made them big, but just look at all the attention they had for. For, for for the the Tomb Raider, for the Deus Ex and and Hitman as well, uh, you know they they are just in this here to sell money, and of course everybody is. I I know everybody is, but again like an EA like an Activision, it just shows that Square Enix is just in it to get units sold, and they don't care if they have to do that over the backs of fans and dedicated fans for years. Chronos being fucked over, Dragon Quest uh, in the West at least, Dragon Quest in the West. Uh, I'm understand, the world ends with you, it was just one sleeper hit title. Uh, But even classic Final Fantasy fans are being fucked over because, you know, what have we seen besides the Bravely series? Nothing, you know, it's completely changed and, you know, it's, it's, you know they do do, do they do near which is great you know take a risk there but it's just i i, I just want them to to you know they 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 i'm just done with square enix you know, and yes i'll buy some some of their titles but they are just they lost their ways and the only thing that is keeping them kind of afloat compared to say some of the other main ones like capcom and konami is that they they do have this very strong hold on the Western market, uh, which is giving them a lot of money. And they do have all these extra cur- uh, curricular activities like figures, like manga publishing, uh, and, and you know publishing Western titles in, in the West, at, uh, in Japan, which is giving them a ton of extra money and cash flow to just be able to do all these types of stuff, you know, so... But they are shooting themselves on the foot with the figuring. Because I used to be a uh, collector of their play arts. But now with the play arts Kai, they're becoming too expensive for the average fan to afford them. So exactly. they're, kind of, they're kind of shooting themselves there. And, uh, I, you know, as much as you can make the, the figurine of higher quality, if you make it a price range that I can't afford, I'm not going to buy it. I'd rather a lower quality figure that is more cost effective. Like the ones they did in the, in the early 2000s, like the ones for Final Fantasy VII, the ones for... Final Fantasy 12, I bought those because they were of the right prices, like 50 bucks maybe, and I thought they were the right pl- price, and I won some Final Fantasy stuff around my room and exactly got that. So, and unfortunately, with most of the figurines they're doing now, it's like $120, and it's just like, that's yeah, as much as I love figurines, that's just, a, that's just a price I'm not willing to venture to, honestly. So Yeah, and then now that I'm getting more into figure collecting, I don't even like the play arts anymore because they're postable and stuff, so... It's very hard to put them in correct poses, and they they're they're easier to break. I'd much rather just have you know solid you know scaled figures that are unposable, and maybe have yeah. some you know yeah, extra additions like weapons and stuff you can put on them. But you know, we haven't yeah we haven't even talked we haven't even talked about Kingdom Hearts Unchained C. Oh yes, I, I think I forgot about that on purpose. <laughs> oh man, I, I just I just want to see that this game 
is not even canon just like a spin-off title i don't even want to i don't even want to have to download that to my iphone whether it's free or not i just don't want just stop it with all the shitty fucking spin-offs <laughs> yeah <sighs> I mean, seriously, I mean, a lot of people are probably saying, well, Greg, you're getting Dragon Quest Hero, you should be happy about that. And yes, I played the Japanese version. Fantastic game. It's worthy of your money. But I'd just like to see a proper Dragon Quest entry brought up, because that's the main reason why we love Dragon Quest. Without those numbered Dragon Quest games, there would be no, like, you know, push to play a game like Dragon Quest Heroes. It's because we love those games. It's why it pushes a fan to play something like Dragon Quest Heroes. And yes, I'm glad they're bringing that out. At this point, any Dragon Quest fan who's listening to this podcast, you'll have to buy Heroes, not just because you want to play it, because it's the only way you can show support for the series, sadly. And I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of people out there that will buy Heroes, not play it, just because they want to give Square Enix the money. And that that's just a sad way about going around about this hobby, just to fund a game in the hopes that there'll be another project in the, in the future that will make use of it, and it never goes well with that mentality, sadly. Yeah. So uh, just another thing that to, 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 to talk about, it's, um, it's, you know, before I mention the title, you know, a lot of people can go into this uh, glass half full, glass half empty. So for some companies, like say an Atlas, whenever they announce something, I'm kind of interested, you know, I go into this, you know, it's going to be great. Now they come on stage and they show that they have this new RPG studio and they're going to be making a new game called Project Setsuna and they show you five drawn images. And some people are, and you know, you, all you guys out there listening and if you are hyped for this, you're entitled to that, don't, don't understand. But why get hype on something, a new studio, five images, you have no idea what's it going to be. And this is Square Enix, like, I am glad, just don't get me on wrong, I am glad to be proven wrong and that Project Setsuna is the best Japanese RPG that I've ever played uh, in the future. But, you know, I, I really have a tough, I, I, I just, you know, I, I, can't, I can't give these guys passes anymore when they just show something maybe. And a maybe in my book for Square Enix is a no. I don't know, how, mm. how do you feel about Project Setsuna? Well, there is nothing to get excited about. I mean, yes, the, I'm glad that there's a new IP, but that that's just that's just, that's a nice thought. But I'm not like excited about it because there's not enough information to make me excited for it. And this, my feeling towards Square Enix is this at the moment is, I don't feel like I'm a fan of the company. I've always I've had my ups and downs with the company a lot of times, and I feel like I'm just a consumer to them. That's that's why I feel I don't feel like if someone says, "Oh, you're a fan of Square Enix," it's like. I just buy some of their games sometimes. <laughs> That's how I feel. That's how I answer a lot of people. Yes, I'll buy Kingdom Hearts games. I'll buy, you know, like Dragon Quest Heroes and all that. And yes, I will be buying uh, Final Fantasy 15 and, um, and of course, Final Fantasy 7 when it comes out. But they, I've always considered them the ultimate 50-50 company. They are not game-making gods. They make more mistakes than most game developers out there. Look at Type-0. Everyone was so hyped for Type Zero, and there were so many things wrong with that game. Like I, I keep warning people, the final battle cannot be lost. Sink that into your brains. That's ridiculous for an RPG, especially a Final Fantasy game. And I'll never even <laughs> get, I'll, I'll never even get that far. You know, I, I, I regret spending a fucking hundred euros on that game, or it was ninety euros. I still haven't sold it. Uh, you know, I gotta get, get jump on it and sell that shit to get some of my money back. But oh my god. Just yeah, you know, just let, let let me see. I actually have the list of Square Enix video games in front of me, so let me actually just break down the stuff that they started from. From you know, it doesn't matter Japanese, doesn't matter, uh, you know, it's 2015. So and just listen to type games that are just mediocre or shit compared to really good gems. So we have Final Fantasy Explorers, Final Fantasy Agito. Life is Strange, Dragon Quest Heroes, Final Fantasy Type-0 HD, Theater Rhythm Dragon Quest, Bravely Second, another Final Fantasy X and X to HD remaster for the PS4, Final Fantasy XIV Heaven Sword, we have Lightning Returns for Steam, 
Triad Wars, Rise of the Tomb Raider, Just Cause 3, Hitman, this PS version, PC version on PS4 for Final Fantasy VII, another PC port for Type-0, Deus Ex, World of Final Fantasy, Star Ocean V, Kingdom Hearts 3, Final Fantasy XV, the Final Fantasy VII real remake, Nier, Project Setsuna, and that is just a slew of games. And not counting as maybe some more Dragon Quest titles that are already out in Japan that I haven't mentioned. And I'm sure that they're going to be doing Kingdom Hearts 1.5 and 2.5 ports. They're going to be yeah. porting, you know, maybe Type-0 to the Vita as well. Uh, there's maybe going to be uh, Final Fantasy uh, 13 trilogy to the PS4. There's going yeah. to be ports. There's going to be ports, ports, ports. And these are all the games that I, that I mentioned. And there literally is no game that has got me very excited. Yes, I will look forward to Kingdom Hearts 3. I kind of look forward to 15 and Final Fantasy 7 Remake, of course. But there's no real game in this here list where I'm just like super excited for. Not even Bravely Second. That is probably my most anticipated title out of all of them. But, you know, it's... They are not even the 50-50 company anymore that do great games but a lot of shit games. They just do a lot of bare minimum. Like if you put it on a percentage scale, you, it's just like this line on like the 60, 60% mark and then it has a couple of dips and maybe a 70%. But, you know, it's just steady, steady, bare bones, just enough. And it's very, very sad because this was a company that was on the 80, 90% range. Yes, I know, back in the day when I was... Growing up, I didn't see all the games in Europe. Uh, I didn't see Toe Ball number one, and I didn't see, you know, the, well, I did see Ur Guys, but I didn't see all the games, but they were so high quality for me. And now it's just, boom, just dumped back down and uh, painful. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can definitely say, yes, there was some stuff I'm interested in, but I think as a whole, the conference was kind of thing and just disappointed that they could have taken that, uh, just just that opportunity to really hit hit it out of the park with, you know, announcing Dragon Quest Seven localization, with, you know, doing something for the Chrono series, you know. And they've already mentioned that they're working on uh, seri games for the Mana and Saga series in production, and I didn't even mention them. And I'm like, <sighs> you know... Good point, actually, I, I, yeah. They, they, they're I think, not actually on the list on Wikipedia, actually, so... Uh, yeah, that's happening as well, and I'm pretty sure that they will be rushed as well and not passionate. Sadly. Yeah. Sadly. Very, very sadly, so... Just the, the, um, the perfect summation of this is... If you want to know how much Square Enix cares about this, they were going to lose the Parasite Eve license... So within like a year or so, they just rushed out the third birthday so that they could do another game. This is mm. the type of company we're dealing with. This is not like, let's say, let's lengthen the Parasite Eve rights we have and just spend time on making like a true property. No, just let's just rush out something as quick as fucking possible. And, you know, that was that went down in history as one of the biggest Square Enix failures I've ever played. But. You know, a lot of fans are actually defending it right now. I, I actually got into a debate or just talk recently where, where I said, yeah, you know, you know how bad the third birthday is. And then people said, you know, that's not really a Parasite Eve game. That's that's the level of, you know, defense we are getting in now. That fans are actually <laughs> saying, man, this is not even a Parasite Eve game anymore. So don't even mention, mention it in the same sentence, like trying to deny it ever happened. But, you know... <laughs> Oh well, <sighs> Square Enix. It's, they 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 always they they always give me happy feelings inside of anger and rage. Yeah, they really they really know how to push your buttons more than any other community. And you and you any other developer. And you could absolutely ha hate them for the moment. There'll be this one thing that they'll tease you with, and then you'll get sucked into it, and then. It's really nothing. But at least this year, okay. Like I said, more news of Kingdom Hearts three. Final Fantasy VII Remake, an episode Dusuke I found fun, so I can't say that they're like the the worst because they do have stuff that I like. But I think we'll end it there because I think our listeners are like, 
Come on, guys. Let's move it along. But we have to get it out there, guys. We we were passionate Square fans way back in the day. And, you know, they can be doing so much more. And I'll say this now. As game you know, developers, they're pretty cool. But as, like, publishers, distributors, and management, it's... it's yeah, man. It's, nah. No, it's never reached. It's never reached back to what they were, so... But... If you think that's going to be the end of this episode, you are wrong because I saved the coolest piece of news last. And Errol and I were talking about this very briefly uh, yesterday, and I was so happy to hear this. Of course, Exceed rocked up at E3. They showed off all their wares, all the games that they recently announced a week or week beforehand. Um... Uh, I think it might be two weeks beforehand, but uh, along, along the lineup was uh, Trails of Cold Steel 1 and 2. And uh, apparently, yeah, they rocked that up and they showed that off at uh, E3. Apparently, a lot of people liked it. Apparently, a lot of people liked it enough to win it one of the best RPGs of E3 Award and one of the best Vita games at E3 Award. Yes. Yes. Finally, Falcom gets some recognition it deserves. <laughs> Oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> blown away. I am blown away the fact that they present this very niche title, such an amazing award. I saw, I actually saw people being outcried, like they did the best RPGs and it's just Western and Japanese RPGs. And a lot of people were like, but man, where's Final Fantasy VII Remake? Or what is this piece of shit called Steel? And I'm like, man, you guys have no fucking ID what you're missing out on. I haven't played Cold Steel yet. I've just played Trails in the Sky. And we all know how great, awesome this is. But I I, I just saw that one minute trailer that they released. And man, it looks fantastic. And I can't wait. Yes, I know it's coming for PS3 as well. But I'm going to go full Vita here. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited for this game. And it has been a couple of weeks, you know, a lot of people asked on the RPG Bridge page, you know, what our thoughts are, and especially you, Greg, what your thoughts are that Cold Steel is indeed finally coming, as well as Cold Steel 2 next year. Mm. I am very excited for it. It's going to be a great year this year later on, uh, because I'm going to be playing Second Chapter, I'm going to be playing Cold Steel 1, and I'm most likely going to be playing Nyatas, 100% English translation as well. And um, I know you have your uh, Operation Obliterate or Ob Burr still going on, so uh, it's the, going to be that, a lot of trails. That is not now officially on hold because <laughs> this news has completely derailed it because, okay, I can't play Soronoki Seki the Third because SC is imminent. And I can't play uh, Cold Steel because if I be cold, if I play Senoki Seki now, it's literally months away before the English translation. That's going to kind of burn things out to replay it that soon so i i did what i did with e7 i just put it down after 10 hours of play and i'm gonna just wait for the english version to experience it you know full blown it's gonna be amazing um and there is really no other kiseki games because i beat zero an hour so you know what i'm doing good sir i'm trailing back to the gagav trilogy <laughs> and no, playing no don't say it ain't so i am i'm playing as we speak i'm playing uh prophecy of the moonlight witch have you beaten all uh, three before, or? Nope, I've only been Tier of a Million. I see. And okay. that, that makes sense because I, I haven't played them, but I, I have seen and have heard so many bad things about these that I don't want to taint that Trails in the Sky love at all with some pretty archaic games. Uh, let's just call it archaic. I don't want to call them shitty. But let, let's just call them archaic. Do you know what? I'm not even going to argue with you because they are. They're very bare-bones arcade games. I will say the translation is much better in Moonlight Witch than it was in Tear of a Million. And the story is actually really old school and it's really interesting. I like the pilgrimage of these two characters. It kind of reminds me of Estelle and Joshua to an extent. So um, I can see why how Trials in the Sky was uh, inspired by Prophecy of the Moonlight Witch because if you don't know, that is the game that turned a, a, a gamer by the name of Toshihiro Kondo into a Falcom fanatic and eventually became the president of, Ka of Ka Falcom because of that one game. So, and you know, there's always been rumors that he's going to be the one that's going to remake that game because that, it's hard to describe the Japanese audience's love for Prophecy of the Moonlight, which it seems to be 
closely to Dragon Quest levels of, you know, just passionate uh, dedication to that one game. Like, it's, it's in, the, in the annals of Japanese, ja, uh, Japanese RPG history. And it was always a game that I was sort of like, you know, I've been waiting for, and finally I got a copy. Now I can finally play it. And just playing it on and off and, re yeah, enjoying it. The battle system's nothing to cry. It's very simple. <laughs> but um, it's just like, you know, if i got a podcast on and I'm roaming around the overworld, I'll just put a podcast on. But whenever there's a story segment, I'll turn everything off and give my full attention. So... Yeah, of course, uh, when SC comes out, I'll be putting it down and be giving all my attention to that. But uh, so awesome to see this get finally get recognized. And of course, the Operation Rainfall YouTube page, they uploaded all the XC game trailers at once. And of course, Trails of Cold Steel was the most viewed. So there is hype and there is interest for the game. So I really hope it does well. And uh, I think I do want to end this episode. I think uh, I've got the way we want to end this because the stomach always in the forefront of my mind. Of course, uh, dedicated gamers, as much as me and Arrow, we like to plan things out in advance. And we always think of like the biggest games we're going to think about. And I will say this, that this last half of the year is going to be very hectic. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about your list, Arrow, but... You know, um, I'm taking sort of like two months off buying like new releases because there isn't really sort of hardcore new releases for me in July and August. But uh, September kicks off with Metal Gear Solid Five, And basically every week until November, there's a, there's a game a week <laughs> for me to buy. <laughs> and wow. it's fucking crazy. Like it starts off. And then uh, apparently there's going to be like, I'm not just talking about RPGs, like Musou games. There's going to be like Arslan Musou, which is based off uh, this this fantasy anime I've watched, which is like amazing. Like it's one of the best anime series I've seen in a long time, especially if you like swords and sorcery and high fantasy. And the fact that we're going to make a Musou game out of that, that's one to import. Then the following week, they're going to have Samurai Warriors 4, X, uh, 4 Warriors 2, 4 2. I'm going to buy that. Um, after that, Oh, what was it? There was there was another game that I was excited for. Then there's Tales of Hysteria. <laughs> and then presumably after that is going to be Trails of Cold Steel. In between all that is going to be Trails in the Sky, second chapter. And then leading up to December with Xenoblade Chronicles X. And the thing that just drives me crazy is Persona 5 is going to fit into that somewhere. So... <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree there. Uh, while it is now June, I feel that I have a very relaxed time until summer, uh, until the end of August. Uh, I am playing Operation Abyss right now, uh, which is a dungeon crawler by experience. I'm just a couple hours in. Uh, I'm going to be playing games like Persona for Dancing All Night import. Uh, I'm going to be playing Etrian Odyssey Untold. Uh, replaying Steins Gate, but in terms of games coming out, not so much. I'll probably play Trails in the Sky 1 again on my Vita. I'll probably do that. I might replay Persona 1 um, and maybe even Devil Survivor Overclocked. So it, it is a, a, a okay summer, but once I am back from my trip to the US and that is mid-September, there is it's crazy because I'm expecting I'm going to buy a couple of games in the US like Lost Dimension and X Blaze uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I'm going to pick those up I'm going to pick up Danganronpa another episode Metal Gear Solid Five and then you know Dancing All Night US release comes out Corpse Party Blood Drive Tales of Sisteria Second Chapter Cold Steel Persona Five some Western guilty pleasures like uh, Black Ops Three and Star Wars Battlefront so. And then I have not even mentioned Etrinology Untold, or did I? So it's a huge list of games for that fall period that is definitely going to be exciting me. And then there, I haven't even talked about, you know, potential Mother 4 release, which is, a, you know, the, the fan-made game. Uh, I still have to play both Zillia games. So uh, I, I have it a little bit busy, um, hmm. but I'm going to be, you know, fighting my battles and just buy games on the cheap like I mentioned a lost dimension I, I might not even buy it's something I have on my radar but if it comes out and it turns out to be not such a good game then I'm just not gonna bother with it at all so you know things like that 
but I do have my work cut out for me. And of course, everything doesn't matter who you are, what you are, which, what time you want for me, I'm dropping everything when Persona 5 is coming out. I will take a couple of days of work for that just to be able to get a good head start in there and being able to enjoy it if it comes out this year. I'm going to be honest, my biggest fear for 2015 is that Persona 5 gets released the same week as Trails of Cold Steel. And I'm hoping that Sony, um, which I will actually finish off because I want to talk about that campaign they did last year, which they kept true to their word, by the way, which I'll get into a little bit. But if they've got some marketing plan for releases and everything, they'll at least give you know, Atlas and XC sort of like some wiggle room where they'll give them some time apart. And of course, with Atlas not having like an official official re- a date, I do believe that Trails of Cold Steel is going to get released before Persona 5. If anything, it'd be interesting if Persona 5 came out December and goes head to head with Xenoblade Chronicles X. That'd be something. <laughs> I think it will. And as much uh, as you look forward to Xenoblade Chronicles X, it is on the Wii U. So, uh, and I know there's many fans that will buy both, but you know. It- I, th- would, I, f- I feel that Persona 5, if it comes out, it will be December. So That would be so hard for me because Persona 4 is one of my favorite games on the PS2. Like I think it's like my third favorite PS2 game. or It could be my second favorite PS2 game. Then you got Xenoblade, which was my favorite, you know, my first fa- my favorite Wii game. That would be a nightmare for me, for me to choose between the two. And I'm gonna be I'm gonna probably play it like a gamer, not as a fan of both series, but as a gamer. Whatever is the better quality game, I'm going to continue playing that, basically. Oh, well, in the end, there's no rush, right? You know, once yeah. you get through it, you can just move on to the next one. But I do agree, it's very enticing to have all these games and not knowing what to pick. Whereas right now, uh, while I'm enjoying Operation Abyss, but I was waiting for that game to be delivered, actually, because I just pretty much had nothing of interest to play. Yes, I have more than 500 games over there. In my room but you know you guys know me i beat my games and then i'm kind of done with them so uh, i know where to pick my battles but it is coming up there's going to be a great slew of titles and lengthy rpg titles as well yes so uh just celebrate all that great stuff you know it's going to be a lot of fun and um yeah great stuff for the rest of the year i will say this though we want to touch upon this that campaign they had for PlayStation on Twitter years ago, they that was one of the most remarkable things ever because it wasn't just shooting, you know, shooting the win. They kept their word. They read what everyone wanted. They read they wanted Shenmue Free. There was a lot of people saying they wanted the Trails games. Look, mysteriously, they helped Exceed out and brought Trails of Cold Steel over. People wanted Sui Coden. They helped brought Sui Coden 2 over. And so many other games. Guess which is the only one that hasn't had any uh, information brought back? It's Yakuza 5. <laughs> yeah, they're still working on that probably. And they said summer. They said that's going to appear out of nowhere. So, And that's a game I'm definitely not going to ignore. So, <laughs> That's true, actually. Yeah, I, I, I'm not really... I tried four. I couldn't really get into it, but yeah. that's 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 coming as well. You know, that's um, that's a good point. That should be coming out in the summer as well. Which, so, uh, if they drop that in August, I think that's the best before the entire, until it gets you know buried under all the releases. So, yeah, um, of course we're 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 of course part of the niche crowd. We enjoy these niche games. Like in terms of like the main sort of. Uh, uh, the main sort of line of game is all the like the most popular games. The biggest battle at the end of the year is going to be uh, Call of Duty, Black Ops, and Fallout 4 because they they are actually getting released between a week of each other. And uh, I have my feelings that Fallout 4 is just going to dominate. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, for me it's just that that guilty pleasure. I play with yeah. my nephew, play that a lot, so I yeah, you know, I just pick it up and you know i play it in bursts and it's just there on my ps4 and it's sitting there and you know it's you know it's it's like it's like it's like going to a to a popcorn blockbuster movie you know you just, yeah, yeah, yeah you just do that and uh, i'm 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 at peace with that but you know it's uh crazy enough where i thought it was going to be a very relaxed 2015 it's gearing up to be quite a sizable spe- right. especially after september it's going to be very busy um so. yeah 
And of course, LBX for me is coming out in November. So shit. <laughs> yeah, but you know, on on the other hand, you know, I feel that January will probably be very slow. Yes. Uh, February maybe, maybe they they drop Fire Emblem Fates or Deus Ex, which they said is going to be coming out in the first quarter. So I, maybe sometime in February. So I, you know. I have. Yeah, it could be February for Fates. I'd be surprised if they don't do the same uh, Awakening release, which is like April. But I think that'd be a bit too much because they look like they've done so much with the localization already. So you're probably right. Yeah, it's gonna uh, be... Awakening was February in North America, by the way. So uh, yeah, it came out a little bit earlier when I imported that. So you know, it's and then there's Bravely Second. So I have a feeling that we'll have some some leeway to beat some of these games when we move into uh, into the next year. Uh, and have a little bit of extra yeah. six, maybe seven, eight weeks before that 2060 lineup starts getting crazy. For sure, and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing where Cold Steel Two fits in <laughs> in all that. So, uh, uh, yeah, I would say a year later that would be nice. Yeah, yeah that would be realistic, honestly. So we'll 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 see that, but uh. Yeah, so it was a really, I would say all in all, it was a very cool E3. They gave a lot of great information for games that were looking forward to. Surprises with those games mentioning. And a lot of other games that might not necessarily be our taste, but we know a lot of people that will enjoy them. So I think all in all, it was a, a good E3 all around for everyone. But it could have been the best Square Enix if you just released Dragon Quest Seven. And I think I'm going to end it off with that. Is there anything else you want to say, Aero? No, it was, uh, it was like I mentioned before, solid E3, lots of great things for the fans. Keep letting your voices be heard. Join on these petitions, not to kill games, but to release new games. Let your voices be heard because they're listening to us now. Share it on social media. It's making sense to do so. And if you are very passionate about a certain game, then jump on it, talk about it. And it looks like pretty much everything, for the most part, is becoming reality for you. So uh, fight those battles out there, f spread the good word, and enjoy the games that you are excited for that were announced or previously announced at E3. And I'm pretty sure we'll see you guys later on for some Tokyo Game Show. Absolutely. That will be the next big episode coming this year. But... Stay tuned for any more episodes that come out before then. And until next time, guys, uh, take it easy. Enjoy your RPGs. And thanks for listening. <laughs>